Welcome to the second video of Structural Madness. Um, here we are going to demonstrate the mathematical reasoning behind um, resonance um, and we'll be discussing about seismic as well as earthquake actions uh, and how damping reduces the uh, force demands and displacement demands on the structure. So let's, let's look at the wind forces first as we looked at it previously. As soon as I turn on the fan, you'll see the same impact again and um, the more flexible the structure, the more it will oscillate under wind. Now, you see the tallest stick is actually oscillating the most violently. We looked at this effect before in our first video of Structural Madness, but here I'm just showing it again to recall what was happening as soon as we start the um, wind or the fan that's placed very close to the to all the balls. Now the stiff of the structure it doesn't respond to wind because there is no resonating impact while the more flexible the structure uh, the higher the resonance and so the higher the displacements. Let me turn this off for a second. Now see even if I stop the fan the most flexible stick is still oscillating and it keeps on going without any significant reduction in motion. This is because the damping coefficient for such a tall flexible structure is very very low at the moment. Um, this is called free oscillation. Once we stop the forces the structure is just oscillating under its own um, inertia. That's Newton's law. Uh, a body that stays in the state of motion uh, stays in the state, same state unless it is opposed by an equal force in other direction. Um, now, if I do a very high frequency vibration, so you see which one is oscillating more? That's because the frequency of my hand was matching closely with the frequency of this particular ball. This is what happens during earthquake and wind. Now the natural frequency of the wind is resonating with the more flexible structure. That means the frequency of the wind forces that are applied is low as compared to the frequency of seismic actions. Let's take a look at the calculations or the reasoning behind why this is happening. Alright, so let's take a look at the mathematical proof behind um, this oscillations and resonating factors. Um, here I have a body of mass m which is connected to the base with two springs of stiffness k over 2 in parallel and damping c over 2 which is also in parallel and an external force f of t is applied on it. Now the f of t function is a harmonic uh, force function which means it is not a random um, vibration like an earthquake uh, ground frequencies it is just like a pendulum that goes back and forth, swings back and forth at a constant rate. So the motion can be described as mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to f of t. This is the inertial force of the system, damping force, the force that is generated in the system because of its inertial motion as well as the external force. Now, f of t, because it's a harmonic function, can be represented as k a cos omega t. Um, I am just replacing the value of f of t over here and dividing the equation with m. Now, the um, function, or I should say, the equation root of k over m is also known as the natural uh, frequency of the system while the viscous damping can be represented as c over 2 omega n into m. 
Now again, this viscous damping is coupled with the natural frequency of the system, so you got, you'll have to remember that. Um, now, once I do that, I replace all the values of um, omega n and zeta in equation above, and I get x double dot plus 2 zeta omega n x dot plus omega n square x is equal to omega n square a cos omega t. Right? Wind is a harmonic force, constant period, it just generates the load at a particular frequency, nothing else. Now, this equation is very common in differential equations, it's a homogeneous equation. So, what do you mean by that? There is a ready steady state solution for such kind of equations. It is known as x of t is equal to c1 sin omega t plus c2 cos omega t. That's a very basic differential equation in mathematics because the equation is homogeneous. If the equation is non-homogeneous, you cannot get a steady state solution for it. We have to figure out the value of C1 and C2. And for that, what we are going to do is differentiate that equation once and you get omega C1 cos omega t because sin omega t becomes omega cos omega t and cos omega t becomes minus omega sin omega t. That's the first order difference here, dif differentiation. Second order will be equal to minus omega square C1 sin omega t plus C2 cos omega t. Replace the value of x dot and x double dot in equation A, which is this one. Once we replace that value of x double dot, x dot and x, we get minus omega square C1 sin omega t plus C2 cos omega t plus 2 zeta omega and omega into C1 cos omega t minus C2 sin omega t plus omega and square C1 sin omega t plus C2 cos omega t which is equal to the external force applied omega n square a cos omega t now omega is the frequency of external force while omega n is the natural frequency of the system do some rearrangement and you get a constant times sine sin omega t plus a constant times cos omega t which will be equal to omega n square a cos omega t now this is rhs in RHS, there is no component of sine omega t. That means this constant has to be zero because sine omega t cannot be zero. And this constant will be equal to omega n square, omega n square a. If you do that, you get something like this, as we discussed, and you can use the method of substitution or Cramer's rule to figure out the value of C1 and C2. I used method of substitution over here because more people can understand it. Um, so that's right there. C1 is equal to 2 zeta omega omega and C2 over omega n square minus omega square. So I can figure out the value of C2 and C1, basic high school maths. I'm not going into details for that. But this function is more important for us. What I did is I replaced the value of C1 and C2 in the equation xt is equal to C1 sin omega t plus C2 cos omega t. Now what I am doing is, this entire equation, let's call it x. I can write down x is equal to root of x times root of x, right? So that's what I am doing over here. This is root of x. And this 2 zeta omega omega n, that's right there. So all I did is, I took root of x times root of x and I just replaced it like brought it inside the bracket so it's 2 zeta omega over omega n that's right there over root of x right is equal to sine phi same thing for the multiplier of cos omega t which will be cos phi so you can see a over remaining is the root x sine phi cos sine omega t plus cos phi cos omega t you can also write it down as x of t is equal to x into cos omega t minus phi now here x is equal to essentially this value which is also known as mechanical admittance or frequency response or you can also kind of understand it as an amplification so what do you do i mean by amplification 
let's say the frequency of external force matches the frequency of the um, natural frequency of the system. Um, that means omega is equal to omega. Now let's say the damping of the system is 0 0.01. Once I replace all those values into this equation, and let's say A is equal to 1 right there, what I get x of omega t is equal to 1 over 1 minus 1 square plus 2 into 0 0.012 2 zeta into omega over omega n is again 1. That is equal to 50. That means right there the value of x is 50. The multiplier on the actual response of the system when damping is equal to 0 0.01 is equal to 50 times just a static force in a way. Let me show you in a graphical format how it looks like. Right there is single degree of freedom dynamic amplification factor. This is 0 0.01 that's the damping we used. That's 10, logarithmic scale, 20, 30, 40, and 50. Right there, just as we calculated. So the amplification is equal to 50 times that of a static displacement for the same magnitude of external force applied. That's what resonance does. It constantly pumps energy into the system and breaks it down if it doesn't have enough damping or inelastic energy dissipation. And that's why buildings fail in earthquakes because of this resonating factor and chimneys fall down in winds and Takuma Nero's bridge collapse in wind was all because of this resonating impact. Like a very skinny bridge has a very low damping factor so the actual response of the system will be 50 times that of a similar magnitude of static force. Just imagine how intensive it is. So that's why in many tall buildings we, we actually increase the damping by either providing water damper at top or uh, providing a tuned mice damper. So as you increase damping, look at the amplification factor. As soon as I'm increasing the damping by twice, the amplification reduced to 25. If I increase my damping to 5%, the amplification reduced to 10. If I increase damping to 10%, the amplification reduced to like 9, 8, 7, 6. So the higher the damping, the less is this amplification and the less force is experienced by the structure. So, so for example, type A 101 that's what is happening in Taipei 101. It's just increasing damping is reducing the wind loads on the structure. So in a wind, as we saw before, a vortices are created on both sides. So there is a suction. The building moves that way. Then after the period 2 pi fs, there will be a vortex over here. So structure will move this way so it just goes back and forth and it's this constant back and forth back and forth at a constant frequency creates this dynamic loads and just by chance if the frequency of the structure is matching this frequency structure will collapse if not enough damping is provided so how does damping help like how can you understand it practically let me show you a demonstration um, First of all, I'd like to thank DCI engineers for letting me borrow this MOLA model. Um, it's a very good tool to explain all the practical structural behavior under dynamic or static loads. So here it's just a one-story portal frame, a moment frame structure. You can see I've provided fixity right there. What I'm going to do is push the structure and see how long it takes to uh, come back and stop the uh, dynamic motion. So I just pushed it, static force. You see, it's, it keeps on oscillating for 
uh, let's say three to four seconds. Now what I'm doing over here is this is a small um, box container filled with water and the frequency of the water is kind of similar to the frequency of the structure so the frequency of both the systems are matching. Putting it on top of this system, push it again. See, it stopped so fast. Um, that's what the damper does. It actually opposes the motion of the structural system. It just stops it very fast and reduces the uh, dynamic amplification factors on the system. Um, so that's the importance of damping for wind as well as seismic actions because it reduces the displacement demands on the structures and thereby reducing the force as well as ductility demands. So if, if your building is not working or let's say you cannot put in any more concrete or increase strength of the material, then think of providing damping because damping is actually reducing the force on the system and if it reduces the force you don't need as much strength to resist all the um, seismic and wind, wind loadings. Um, so that, I'd say that's all for uh, this week's video um, about damping and how frequency and resonating factors changes the behavior of the systems. Um, stay tuned to Structural Madness for more updates and more fun discussions, I would say. And thank you for watching. And please comment and give me suggestions like where I, where I should improve in my explanations or my demonstrations. Uh, thank you for watching this again and have a good night.